You might have seen waves in animations about quantum mechanics before, but what are they? People refer to them as the wave function of an object, but what is that exactly? Well, it's basically the state of an object. Like if I was to ask you, hey, what's that electron of yours doing these days? Tell me everything. Then I might expect a certain type of answer. Like I don't want to know what the mass of the electron is or how hopelessly negative that electron is because all electrons are always like that. So the state is actually what's variable, you know, like where is it hanging out? What speed is it going at? What are its energy levels like? Those sort of things. Classically, I'd just expect a list of numbers and I'd call that the state. But quantum mechanics says that this is all wrong. A particle usually doesn't have just one position or one momentum or one energy. Instead, it's in a quantum superposition of different options. But that's not the only thing wrong with giving just a list of numbers to describe the state of this electron. In quantum mechanics, the information about the position is not independent of the momentum and energy. Instead, all of the information about the state is packaged together in something called the wave function, and it's represented by this thing here called psi. Here's an analogy for this wave function. It's kind of like a multifaceted crystal. If you're looking at it from one direction, you're seeing the face that represents the position, and you instead want to know about the momentum, then you have to apply some sort of transformation to the same wave function to figure out how to look at it a different way. In this case, the transformation between the position and the momentum actually looks like a Fourier transform, and we'll go into what that means in a second. But it is the fact that all of this information is in the same wave function and you have to apply different transformations to look at the different pieces of information that lead to things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And understanding these transformations, which are called change of bases operations, is super fundamental to how quantum mechanics works. So let's try and understand the wave function. We'll start by trying to write the wave function in the so-called position basis. As you may know, in quantum mechanics, no object is allowed to be in exactly one position. There's always some amount of fuzziness to where it is. In fact, it makes pretty little sense to draw an electron like a little ball like this. It's a bad habit of mine. Really, these things are much more spread out, kind of like a wave. Let's see why. To start off, let's imagine that there are only four places that this electron can be. Here, 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 or here. Then, according to quantum mechanics, actually this electron would be in a superposition of all four of those places at the same time. But it doesn't have to be an equal superposition. In some sense, it can be more in one place than another. So here's an example. Imagine that these numbers here are the weights that kind of represent how much the particle is in these four places. As you can see, the weights can be negative. Then we would write the state as this superposition. So this looks a bit intense, but let's break it down. So it's saying the wave function is equal to the state where the particle is exactly at x1 plus the state where the particle is exactly at x2 plus the state where it's at x3 and x4. Then these coefficients represent how much the particle is in each of these four possible states. Like a4 is very big, it's negative but it's a big negative number and so that makes this particle a bit more in the position x4. And what I really mean by that is when you try and measure this particle, you may know that in quantum mechanics, you can't actually catch an object being in a superposition when you try and measure it. And so instead of being in all four positions, it's going to collapse to being in one of those positions. And the probability that it's going to collapse to one of these four options depends on the size of these coefficients. Here's the rule. 
The probability of finding this particle at the position x4 when you measure is a4 squared. So that's how this negative number becomes a positive probability. So then let's say we open the box and we find the electron in the spot x4. Now every other part of the wave function disappears except x4 and this electron is just in that spot. So there you go. That's how the wave function looks in the position basis and what happens when you do a measurement. Or at least that would be the full story if it was the case that this electron can only be in these four different places. But actually, reality is a little bit more complicated. This electron is in fact allowed to be anywhere inside of this box. There's a common misconception that a lot of people have about quantum mechanics, and that is that everything is discretized. Like, for example, position. People think that the whole world is cut up into little cubes of side length, the Planck length, and, and particles couldn't possibly live between grid points. Instead, they're only allowed to be exactly inside of the grid. This is just not true at all for position. If I captured an electron inside a tiny box like this, I wouldn't expect to just see it at some discrete positions. In fact, if I was to measure this electron, I might find it at any point inside of this box. So all of these positions are allowed. And the electron is in a superposition of all of these positions. Unfortunately though, that makes the mathematics a little bit more complicated. So instead of just having four coefficients that represent each of the four possibilities, we're now going to have to find a different way to represent the coefficient for these infinite number of states inside of this box. To do that, I'm going to employ a function called psi that has a value for every single one of the positions possible inside of this box. For example, at this particular position x prime, the height of the function is psi of x prime, which is this number, and it's negative. This seems to solve the problem because now if I was to open this box and measure the electron, then the probability that the particle is at x prime should just be that height squared, surely. But actually, not quite. I wish it was that simple. The real problem here is the premise that if I was to measure this electron, I would end up just getting one particular answer, one particular position. But that's not possible. Because remember, we already said that it's not possible for the electron to just be in one exact spot. And yet, if I was to measure it in that particular spot, it would need to collapse to being in just that spot, which is not possible. So what goes wrong? The thing that goes wrong is that, of course, all measurements have some amount of uncertainty. And so you wouldn't be able to resolve the position of the electron exactly. There would be some amount of give. For example, say I had this ruler and it's really just not that good. I can resolve that a particle's kind of inside of here or here or here or here, but not really much more than that. So in this case, let's say I measured and got the outcome here, then it would collapse psi to be zero everywhere else and non-zero only in this region. What's the probability of this happening, of getting this outcome for the measurement? To find that out, you've got to mark where that region starts and ends, then the probability of measuring the state between A and B is equal to this area under the curve squared. So through that example, I hope you can see how this function psi is related to the wave function by somehow providing the weights that give the probabilities. So in other words, this function encodes how much the particle is in a superposition of each of these spots. And as you can see, it's more in these two regions than it is in, say, this region. So this function psi represents the weights in some sense, but it's not itself the wave function. The wave function needs to look a little bit different because it 
is in a superposition of being in every one of these states. So in other words, for every single position in here, so let me call this one x1, x2, of course this is laughable, I can't just sort of count out each of these positions, but you know, you get the gist. If I write out every single one of those positions, then I need to be able to write the wave function as some combination of all of those possible positions. You know, like this, etc, etc. In fact, this is an uncountably infinite sum. So instead of using the sum notation, we need to use an integral, but we'll get to that in a second. In front of this is some coefficient for each possible place, and that number is related to psi. As we saw, that number can't be psi of x1, for example, exactly, but it is something very close to that. So for now, let's just leave it as some sort of relationship to this psi. But if we want to understand this, we really need to first think about what each of these little states means. First, let's think about the case where we only have one position. So this particle is definitely in x1. We've already said that this is not possible. This state is an impossible state. And if you look at the psi for this function, you'll see why. In this case, psi of x is just an infinite long line right at x1, and it's zero everywhere else. Obviously, that's not mathematically possible. That's not a function. And so this state is just actually not allowed in quantum mechanics. But these states are very useful because they form together this thing called the position basis. So if you consider every possible position and you write the states like this for each one of them and you collect them all together, that is called the position basis. And why is that useful? Because you can write every other state as a combination of all of these. As I alluded to earlier, the right way to do this is to take an integral because this is a uncountable infinity of different positions, and so to add them you need to use this special language. But the idea is the same as before. And now the right way of weighing each of these different x's is to put that psi of x in there. So there you go. This is the actual position basis wave function. So what I mean by that is this on this side this is the wave function, the true wave function that encapsulates everything about this particle. On the other hand, this is called psi and is often um, sort of mistaken for the wave function, or at least physicists, we like to kind of call it the wave function because it encapsulates the same information as is in here, but it's all in the position basis. In other words, it tells you very explicitly what's happening with position. But there's more than one way to look at this same wave function. For example, maybe I'm not actually that interested in the position of the particle. I'm not going to measure the position. Instead, what I want to measure is the momentum. Then this form of the wave function is not super useful to me. So what I want to do is take this form of the wave function and transform it so now it talks about the momentum instead. So how do we do that? Well, surprisingly, the answer here is going to look a lot like going from this audio waveform to this frequency map, which maps out the main frequencies in what I'm saying. And for example, here's a recording of me trying to whistle a single note. And here are the actual notes that I played. To do that transformation between the position basis to the momentum basis, or in other words going between psi and phi, which is a function of the momentum, we need to first understand what a momentum basis state looks like. Remember when we were dealing with position basis states, we said that they were states that are in exactly one spot. So an infinite spike at just that particular spot. Therefore, a momentum basis state is a really similar thing, but now just for momentum. It means that this particle has exactly p dash momentum. So it's going at exactly one speed. And at that speed, there's an infinite spike. 
just like with the position basis states that don't actually exist, the momentum basis states also don't quite actually exist. You see, their function is also just infinite at a particular point, and that is not a real function. But just like with the position basis states, this is a very convenient fiction. And so for now, let's just see what this kind of state would look like. In particular, I want to know, well, if the momentum looks like this, what does it look like in the position basis? Well, we can figure this one out from the de Broglie relationship, which says that if the state is just one momentum, then when you look at that same state in the position basis, it's going to look like one infinitely long sign and it's going to be traveling at the speed given by that momentum. And to find out what wavelength this sine function should have, you just use this simple equation. So that's how we do the most simple case of translation between momentum and position, when we just have one momentum. But what about the case when you have a superposition of two different momentums in the momentum basis? What does this look like in the position basis? Well, it basically looks like two different sine waves layered on top of each other with different wavelengths depending on exactly what this momentum is. If we now go back to the music case, you'll understand why this is. So in music, when you have a single pure frequency, that does translate to having a perfect sine wave when you look at the audio form. But if someone was to play two notes at the same time, then the audio form would look like two sine waves added together. But even though this looks like a mess, when you then go back into the frequency space, you'll see two spikes. In fact, no matter how much of a mess the audio form is, you can always break it down into its component frequencies. And that is the exact same transformation that's happening between the position version of the wave function and the momentum version of the wave function. It's called a Fourier transform. Taking a Fourier transform sounds very complicated, but it's actually a really simple process. Basically what you do is if you have this wave function, psi, and you want to break it down into its component momentums, first, break it up into a bunch of different sine waves. So these sine waves, when they're added together, are going to equal this function. Now each of those sine waves has an exact momentum. So for each one of those, put a point down on this graph. And that is how you go between these two. So it's actually not that complicated. And as you can see, it's also reversible. If I want to go from the momentum space or like the frequency space and map back to the position version of the wave function, then all I have to do is the reverse Fourier transform. The point is that there is a nice mathematical way that you can transform the wave function so that you can look at it in any direction that you're interested in. And these transformations are reversible. And in the end, all of these different facets are the same wave function. There is only one wave function, but it's just a matter of perspective. This video is part of a whole course that I'm doing on quantum mechanics, so you can see the rest of it in this playlist.